Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, all about financial projections for your business. My name is Meredith Medlin, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Thanks for being here. I serve as the Director of Partnerships and Impact for Axion Opportunity Fund, a national nonprofit organization that provides affordable capital as well as wraparound business resources to small business owners across the country with a specific focus on entrepreneurs of color and women entrepreneurs. Before I introduce today's speakers and we begin our conversation, I just want to quickly go over a few housekeeping items with you. First, you should be able to view our presentation through the Zoom webinar tools window on your desktop or your mobile device, depending on how you joined us today. Next, you'll see a chat function in the black toolbar of the Zoom window. So please locate that chat button and type in any questions you have for us throughout the presentation. I'll administer a question and answer session based on the questions that are typed into that chat window following today's presentation. Also, we are recording today's webinar, as you probably know, so please know that you'll be able to refer back to that information presented today. You'll be able to refer to it at a later time. I'll send an email containing a link to the recording within the next day or so after we conclude today. And lastly, just before uh, we get started, I want you to know that once, uh, once this webinar concludes, you'll be prompted to complete a very short survey. This survey is only four questions and we really value your feedback. So please do take just a couple of minutes to give us your thoughts on the webinar. Today's conversation will center around some of the most important things for you to keep in mind as you formalize your business finances and seek to make realistic projections about your financial future. We're really excited to get started, but before we dive into this discussion, I just want to introduce my colleague, Philip Henry from Fifth Third Bank, who will share a bit about the bank's commitment to the community. We are so grateful to our partners at Fifth Third Bank for sharing our commitment to small business, and I'm really glad to have you with us today, Philip. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you, Meredith, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Philip Henry, Corporate Social Responsibility Manager at Fifth Third Bank. And once again, thank you for joining today's webinar, Financial Projections for Small Businesses, our fourth small business webinar of 2021 in partnership with the Axion Opportunity Fund. Our commitment to put business customers at the center of everything that we do is a driving force behind our ongoing collaboration and partnership with Axion Opportunity Fund. Together, we share a common goal, and that's helping entrepreneurs overcome barriers and achieve business growth by expanding access to capital and educational resources. Fifth Third Bank, in collaboration with the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, made a commitment to invest $32 billion into the communities that we serve through 2020. We have exceeded our commitment with significant help and engagement with our community and business partner organizations such as AXA and Opportunity Fund. As you can see here from the slide, we have completed that five-year plan. Fifth Third Bank is committed to all of the markets that we serve. Several hundred entrepreneurs have been helped through our support of economic development programs, including technical assistance and micro lending for small businesses through partners like Axie and Opportunity Fund. If you're launching your business or expanding it, our team at Fifth Third Bank and our resources are available to you every step of the way. Please visit our business resource center at 53.com and let us help you meet your financial goals and assist you with smart financial solutions for both your personal and business needs. Thank you and back to you, Meredith. Thanks so much, Philip. And now I am pleased to introduce our panelists for today who are going to lead our discussion. Uh, so Ian McDermott serves as the financial program manager at Start Small Think Big, a nonprofit organization with whom AOF has enjoyed a really wonderful partnership for many years. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks, Meredith. All right. And also, I'm thrilled to welcome Ed Timberlake from Fifth Third Bank, who's been gracious enough to join us today to share his insight based on years of experience working with small business banking customers. Welcome, Ed. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. I'm happy to be here representing Fifth Third Bank's business banking team. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So we are so glad that you're both with us. And to get things started, I will hand it over to Ian to share a bit about Start Small Think Big and then jump into our presentation today. Great. Thank you again. So uh, as Meredith mentioned, my name is Ian. I'm the uh, financial program manager at Start Small Think Big. So in today's uh, presentation, we've got a number of slides with uh, a lot of uh, 
technical content. So I do want to make it available to everyone. So I'm typing into the chat here a link. If you would like to access uh, those slides, you can copy and paste that. And, uh, and you should be able to follow along your pace and uh, see some of the uh, detail we talk about. Uh, Start Small, Think Big is a nonprofit. We help under-resourced entrepreneurs create thriving businesses in underserved areas, uh, building wealth for themselves, their families, and their communities. Uh, this happens through uh, direct service delivery from either staff or our pro bono uh, partner volunteers. Uh, these happen uh, or these come through uh, services uh, from either the financial program, of which I'm a, a member of, the marketing program, or our legal program. And the general idea is that we're trying to provide services that would otherwise uh, be difficult to access uh, for communities either uh, of color, of historically uh, marginalized uh, uh, identities. Um, we serve businesses across the country. Uh, we used to be just headquartered in New York in the Bay Area, but uh, because of COVID, we've shifted services online. So if you're in need of services, um, you think our services could help, you should reach out to us. We have services open to the public like these workshops, um, but much more uh, thorough, detailed wraparound services that we can provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, to folks who become full clients. Again, all this service uh, delivery is completely free. We provide these uh, pro bono. Uh, the types of businesses that we can serve range from uh, any industries, uh, really any stages with the floor and ceiling of actually operating. So we don't serve idea stage businesses. So it's once you kind of test out the market, uh, we've really looked to see at least $500 sales in the last three months, and then a ceiling of a million dollars of annual revenue. So if you're somewhere in between that $500 of sales, a million dollars of sales each year, we uh, should be able to help you if you are otherwise in need. Um, the three programs that I mentioned, uh, the legal program is, uh, is our oldest one, it's where the organization started, and they can help in a number of different issues, whether that's setting up your entity, becoming an LLC or a corporation, uh, working on contracts, uh, either with contractors or different uh, partners, clients, um, and, uh, and, and looking at details like negotiations, um, some kind of uh, lease review, things along those lines. Um, anything but litigation, we can try to arrange uh, an attorney to, to work through those issues with you. Uh, the marketing program, uh, really marketing and sales. So this could look at things like your website, your general strategy, social media strategy, um, uh, things like logo design as well, and, uh, and trying to identify different sales channels that might be a fit for your product or services. And then from the financial program, we uh, really kind of operate out of either infrastructure or growth and strategy. Uh, so the financial systems and management, talking about banking and bookkeeping, making sure that your numbers are getting compiled and uh, organized in a way that's easy for you to analyze. And then you can get assistance uh, actually making decisions based on those numbers. And that's really where the projections and planning come in. Uh, so that's obviously what we'll be talking about primarily today. Uh, and we might identify some needs for additional capital, and then we can discuss what options are out there for financing, kind of how best to present your business for those financing opportunities. So today's workshop, since we're really focused on financial projections, there's a few things that we need to uh, discuss to be able to get there. One is establishing benchmarks. And it's really just going to be collecting the numbers so we can see what to plug into projections. And then we're going to break down the steps of uh, at least a very simple uh, uh, entry set of financial projections. And that's going to involve uh, developing an income statement, also known as your profit and loss statement. So we'll talk about what those sections are and the vocabulary that you'll see in there. And then a cash flow statement, which is uh, a little bit additional uh, data that comes after the profit and loss statement. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and essentially, your, uh, the steps we walk through in these financial projections would allow you to create projections for both of those. Once we have some basics of how to do projections, we can talk about some of the common considerations that you might have once you run that analysis. Um, and you might start making decisions uh, that could be about pricing, 
probably the most common uh, consideration that comes to mind, especially for say product-based businesses. Um, and there are a num number of other uh, metrics or pieces of data that we can look at that might indicate some changes that would be helpful for your business. Uh, so to clarify here, um, when we talk about financial projections, I know a lot of different things come into folks' minds, and it might seem like we're asking you to develop a crystal ball to do uh, predictions, but it really doesn't have to be that involved. Um, that's, of course, an ideal situation. The more data you have, the better you'll be able to, to get in terms of forecasting or predictions. Uh, but there are some really core, simple exercises that projections involve uh, that'll be helpful for any business at any stage. So the first thing, we're trying to figure out what your individual sales are, uh, what they cost, and making sure that your pricing at least covers that. But then there are uh, ideas about breaking even, right? Are you actually covering all of the costs outside of that individual sale? The full business is required to pay for certain things. And then uh, you being able to pay yourself, pay for income taxes, whatever it is that you actually need to do. Uh, and if you're in a situation where you have loans, certain amount of capital, how much time do you have to really be able to uh, uh, make the business work before you run out of that money? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about those uh, analyses um, and additional scenarios you might consider. This is really where projections uh, happen after you do those basic uh, numbers about costs and prices. Um, we need to think about what happens at certain sales volumes, what happens to certain expense structures? Um, are these feasible uh, or do I need to change some of my basic core business model considerations? So the steps we'll go through will be identifying sales units. What are the costs that go into those sales units known as variable costs? And then what are the other things that we're paying for? And then we'll look uh, over time at what these benchmarks are um, that we can plug in. How can we uh, change these? consider different uh, uh, or changes to those benchmarks. What are we looking for in terms of goals or budgets? Uh, and what are some real limitations either in production? I can't make this number of sales, it's not possible. Um, I need more time for vacation, my family life, whatever it is. Uh, and we'll talk about plugging those back in so you can run a separate iteration of your projections, right? So it's never just, I do this once and forget about it. There are going to be a bunch of considerations that we suggest for you, and you're going to have to identify what's going to be most useful for you. Um, I think, Ed, maybe uh, if you have any uh, contributions here you wanted to add before we jump into the details. Sure. Uh, so I will start off by saying that, you know, uh, approaching this from the standpoint of a bank, uh, understanding your cash flow when you are looking to access capital from, you know, whether it's your bank or any other lender. Uh, if your lender cannot understand your cash flow, they will not be able to lend money to you. And so putting together your projections, you know, really can be a very important part of your business, uh, not only just when looking to access capital, but, you know, just as Ian mentioned before, even with your pricing. You know, you, it's important that you understand whether your pricing really makes sense, especially for the industry that you're in. In addition to that, you know, as you, as uh, Ian mentioned, your, your variable costs and from industry to industry, costs can, you know, really fluctuate. Uh, and in some industries, you know, the cost can be a little bit lower. But, you know, with us just now coming through a pandemic, we've all seen how volatile the market can really be. And so, you know, uh, Ian mentioned, you know, of course, we don't expect you to have a crystal ball, but we do expect you to really be able to put some thought into these numbers and, you know, really be able to explain to us where they came from and that it's not just some numbers that you pulled out of air. I'll give a, a really quick uh, real life example. I was working with a, a mom and pop startup restaurant some years back, and they came to me with their projections. And, you know, in the first year, they projected that they want to do a half a million dollars uh, in revenue in the first year. But, but uh, where the restaurant was located at, it was in a very uh, small town, very rural town. And so what I helped them to uh, do with their projections was to back into those numbers. So I got them to show me their sample menu. And with that, we came up with a median plate price. And with that median plate price, 
um, I was able to walk them through to show, okay, this is how many people you need to see in a in a, a day, in a week, in a month, in a year, in order to realize these projections. And once they backed into them that way, they realized that those numbers weren't realistic. So, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of add that. I'll add that and then leave that for right now. And uh, I'll chime in a little bit more as we go, uh, Ian. Perfect. Extremely helpful. And I think really illustrates uh, a couple of things that we're talking about. One of those I can step right into this idea of what's realistic. It's always going to be easiest to identify once you're actually operating. Right. So uh, there's, as mentioned, a number of places where any business or aspiring business owner can begin their projections. But the most realistic ones, the ones that are going to be uh, easiest to convince a lender of or an investor or a partner, uh, are ones that are based off of some actual achievements that you've had. So when you start sales, whether that's before you have an entity set up or once you've gotten uh, something structured, uh, registered with state, uh, ideally the financials are getting tracked somewhere. The easiest way to do that or to get started doing that is gonna be by having an actual bank account for the business. Now, if you have you know, an LLC or a corporation uh, where there's supposed to be this legal separation between you, the owner, and the entity. You really need something that's called a business bank account under that business's name. And that's for legal reasons. Uh, but uh, even for being able to, or, or even for sole proprietors, partnerships, where there's not this liability separation, you still will benefit from having a separate bank account that has all the business transactions in it. Uh, this way, when you're either preparing applications for a loan or just preparing taxes. You don't have to go through one bank account that's got personal transactions, it's got business transactions. You'll have it all clearly there. Um, we're gonna talk more about what those numbers really mean or in terms of uh, uh, bookkeeping, it's gonna be really helpful to distinguish, um, but there's at least a clear place for you to do this more easily without the extra effort. Uh, now, each bank is going to offer different uh, uh, products um, and, uh, and conditions, terms, and relationships that you can have with the banks, and it can really uh, contribute to you being able to access capital over time, even if you're just starting out with a checking and savings account. So it's really something we would uh, always advise, trying to get banked for your business uh, as early as you can so we can start seeing those numbers in one clear place. Once you have that bank account, it's going to be much easier for you to jump into bookkeeping. Bookkeeping might sound like a very technical, uh, complex uh, set of work uh, that business owners need to hire someone else for. And when you can afford to do it, it's great because there's uh, additional expertise that that bookkeeper or accountant might be able to contribute to your business. But this is something that every business owner, every person can do themselves. Luckily, we live in a, in a digital age, so there are software options that are fairly easy to learn or to at least get started on. The main thing we're trying to do when we have those bank deposits and withdrawals is figure out what they actually represent. Uh, some bank deposit uh, on your bank statement might not indicate that your business actually made any money. Uh, that might just be money that you invested from your personal account. Uh, in some cases, it could be sales tax you've collected and now need to give back to the state. All those things we want to annotate. We want to give additional detail to. And that's what a bookkeeping system does. It takes those deposits and withdrawals and turns them into real financial language that allows you to generate the statements, two of which we'll talk about today, profit and loss and the cash flow, um, but to really be able to pull insights from the business without having to uh, re uh, name every transaction every time you go look at the numbers. Um, some really straightforward benefits you're going to get from that is identifying when I'm spending way too much on this thing. I need to set a budget for this. I have room to spend more. Um, all these insights are going to be a lot easier to, to pull when you have numbers in an organized bookkeeping system that came from a separated business bank account. Uh, the digital bookkeeping options, the softwares we've mentioned, most of these are now offered uh, on the cloud. So you don't have to go to uh, your local electronic store and get a CD and then it's stuck on one device forever. Now you can log into a website. Um, the two that I have mentioned here are QuickBooks and Wave. And they both have these online cloud-based systems, create a login. And every time you edit your books, 
you can then access those edited books on any other internet connected device. You can invite either accountants, partners, even employees, if you just want them to see bits of the uh, books, maybe submit timesheets, not see your banking information. All of that's possible because it's cloud-based um, and it can save you time because systems like QuickBooks, at least, they learn, right? So whatever you're doing, uh, it'll start doing for you and save you time. Um, and you will now be more able to separate a part of your week. Typically talk about one hour a week for bookkeeping, where you're actually categorizing transactions so that the systems can generate those statements. And that means if you've got a 40 hour business work week, the rest of your 39 hours, you can dedicate to sales, management, whatever it is that you actually like doing, because you know, this one hour at the end of every week is when I'm gonna be doing my bookkeeping. So I don't need to worry about it the rest of the time. There are a ton of different options out there for uh, bookkeeping softwares. Some of those primarily client relationship or uh, um, uh, customer management, um, project management as well. And then they have a back end of bookkeeping. The two I have mentioned here are primarily bookkeeping systems that have other uh, uh, um, services they deliver as well. Uh, QuickBooks being an industry standard kind of uh, household name, it's great, it's just cost money. So the question is, are you gonna get enough benefit out of uh, the system um, with those additional features to justify the cost uh, that's coming in monthly to, to use that system. Um, Wave is another option. Uh, I mentioned this because it does not have a cost to use. So you can use the basics of Wave for free. So if you're not sure why you should start doing bookkeeping, you can just get started on a free system and it's gonna generate statements that give us the benchmarks for us to do financial projections. Uh, as mentioned, you can do early stage thought-based projections, but we want to iterate with more and more data uh, when we get it. So as we walk into the uh, steps of financial projections, two pieces of vocabulary that are gonna keep coming up. So I wanna bring them up here uh, first, and then you'll hear them uh, again throughout are types of expenses, right? So uh, with expenses, we're talking about things that the business needs to pay for, right? You wouldn't have paid for these things unless you were running the business. If you were running some other business, you wouldn't have paid for them. Um, two uh, phrases or the two sections of expenses that you'll see on a profit and loss statement in your tax filings are either cost of goods sold or operating expenses. Uh, now, over time, you might get a better sense of what these are in your business, but the general idea is gonna be, when do you actually pay for these things? So if you're paying for something every time that you make a sale, that is a direct cost, right? Those costs come directly uh, with the volume of sales that you make or the production of those sales. So they multiply with the number of sales you either produce, prepare for, or make. Um, examples might be uh, the raw materials going into a specific product. If you're shipping something to the product, right, you're only paying for those things when you make those sales. If you don't make any sales, you're not paying for them at all. Now, in finance, there are a lot of synonyms and sometimes slightly different uh, 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 definitions to uh, different pieces of vocabulary. When folks are talking about cost of goods sold, this could be for a service-based business, cost of services, cost of revenue. Um, as mentioned, they are direct costs, also known as variable costs. The variable here doesn't mean that they change every week. It means that they change based on the volume of sales. They, are vary, uh, they vary based on the volume of sales. What the opposite of that would be, uh, or the distinction from those cost of goods sold, variable costs, are fixed costs. Uh, operating expenses is really the accounting term. So this refers to everything outside of those individual sales, right? So if you're not only paying for this because you made sales, maybe you have a monthly rent, an office, a kitchen space, whether you make sales or not, you're gonna be paying for those things. So these things are fixed. They're not tied to the uh, number of sales that you make. Uh, they could be uh, changing from month to month. Maybe your advertising and marketing changes um, but it's not changing based on the volume of sales. That's what makes it an operating expense, right? So other uh, uh, synonyms, indirect cost, fixed costs, 
Sometimes uh, or very often the phrase overhead gets used. This is really more uh, often referring to the operating expenses rather than the cost of goods sold. But this is not a very specific term. Uh, it's not like a, an accounting term. It's, it's a more and more common term. So as I've mentioned that vocabulary, we can start to plug it into the actual steps of financial projections. The first thing is to identify what you're actually selling. This might sound silly, but we need to break it down into sales units. So a bakery business, um, we need to figure out what specifically their sales units are. Now, this doesn't have some set legal or accounting definition. Sales units can be defined by the business. It's gonna be a question of what's the easiest way for you to refer to your sales. Um, do you want to say, I made 10,000 sales last week? Uh, or do you wanna say, I made one sale last week, right? You could be talking about um, uh, pallets of products. That's just one pallet. You could be talking about 10,000 of the things that made up a pallet. Um, in the examples that uh, I'm gonna go through, we're gonna talk about cookies. And in this business, um, they actually sell two cookies in one package. So the easiest thing for them to do is refer to that package of two cookies as one sales unit. Now for another business, they might just have one, uh, or for another product, they might just have one, let's say muffin per sales unit per package. So it's probably easiest for them to just consider that one muffin, uh, muffin a sales unit. Now for service-based businesses, this is a, can be a little trickier. Um, uh, even for food businesses that might be doing catering or uh, things that aren't as defined where there's clear uh, uh, a product that gets produced and then sold out. Um, so even in your catering jobs, this is a, or, or catering businesses, this can be a similar um, uh, uh, consideration. Now, time bound sales units are at least the easiest way to start. Right? Every time I sell this job, it takes me one hour. So I'm gonna identify how many hours uh, I need to make sales during, how much each hour I need to charge. That's gonna be the easiest way to at least get started on this, but it might not be the most helpful over time as you do different iterations of your projections. If you've already started doing sales, let's say that those catering jobs or other kind of service-based um, uh, uh, sales you've made, you can just take examples and start to consider them, uh, examples of what you've already done, start to consider them as sales units. So you might say, well, this summer I did the Smith job and I'm gonna call this uh, out of three tiers, tier three pricing because it was a little bit more involved than uh, the other job. I didn't really make that much money on it. Maybe there's slight variations there. Again, up to you to define. Um, but the main idea is if I do another job like this Smith job, what would it look like? Right? So what is the reproducible sales unit? Uh, it's going to differ for every business, but you need to be able to communicate uh, what that sales unit is, why you've identified that as a sales unit. Uh, because that's really the basis of what the rest of the projections are going to uh, be based on. Now, um, once we've identified that sales unit, the question is, what costs go into each of those sales? Now, for product-based businesses, this is probably a little bit more straightforward. Um, you can take every time I sell this chocolate chip cookie sales unit for $2.50, what are the things that go into it? You, of course, have your ingredients. Um, but there might be some other things as well, whether that's packaging, if you're doing shipping, labels, um, or the actual cost of, uh, of the uh, labor you're using for the production of this uh, cookie unit, or the uh, commercial kitchens if you're paying by the hour, right? If you're paying by the hour for either labor or um, uh, the, the kitchen cost or office space, then it's a direct cost, right? Uh, there's a certain number of sales that you can produce for in each hour. So you'd ultimately wanna figure out uh, what that cost per unit is. And the same thing with these ingredients. You can't go to a store and get just two cents of granulated sugar probably, right? You probably got a full bag. Um, maybe it takes six months for you to get rid of that bag so you can figure out how many cookies you sold in that six months. Um, but more likely or ideally, you would, uh, you would really break down what the measurements of these different uh, products are um, and uh, uh, what your actual unit consists of, your sales unit. 
So when you add up all those direct costs, you get a total uh, COGS per unit. Um, and when you subtract that from your price per unit, that's when you get, it's either called a contribution margin or a gross profit margin. It's your gross profit margin. It's not considering those operating expenses. Now for service-based businesses, you might be wondering if you have any cost, uh, uh, cost of goods sold. And especially early on, you might not have any, especially if you're just picking up the phone, doing a consultation every time you make a sale and then you get paid for it. That might not have costs every time you pick up that phone. Um, but over time, you might start paying for others to pick up the phone. And if you're paying for them every time they pick up the phone and only if they pick up the phone, those would be cost of services, direct cost in, in accounting terms, cost of goods sold. Uh, the main question is, am I paying for anything based on the volume of sales? Right? Commissions uh, or even payment processing fees is something that is going to multiply the more sales you make. Uh, so want to think about this again, over time, you'll start to identify what these uh, really are for you. What's the easiest way for you to uh, project them as direct costs or as uh, fixed costs. Fixed costs are going to be pretty straightforward for businesses that are already operating. You can go backwards and say, what were the things that I paid for? Uh, if you have a bookkeeping system, you'll be able to literally just copy and paste the categories of your fixed costs and what you paid for them uh, each month. Right? So these vertical columns would be months, the rows being the things that you paid for. Categories are flexible. It's based on what's the easiest way for you to look at your numbers and understand uh, what's actually going on. So again, really want these to be uh, decided by you. Do I want to distinguish uh, advertising and marketing that I pay for monthly from advertising and marketing that I pay for seasonally? That's a question that might help you identify changes to what you're paying for, your marketing strategy. Uh, if these were all together, it'd be harder to tell whether the reason you made more sales in January was because of a new marketing uh, expenditure or, or initiative. Um, but when they're separated, you can really start to get a sense of what was different in different months. Um, so the way that this is structured is just to have those kind of monthly recurring, maybe subscription-based ones uh, in one place. But the math is the same because it just keeps adding up for even the ones that are non-monthly. Right? So there might be ones that are annually, uh, annual, either the uh, website hosting or your insurance. Um, uh, but there might be things that you just pay for every once in a while, maybe some pop-ups or uh, licenses based on what uh, operations you're, you're running at different points in time. So they're all operating expenses, but it might be helpful to see, well, every month we got to pay for this stuff, and then it's going to change uh, on certain months with the rest of this stuff. And you get a total for what the operating expenses are each month. Now we've got the kind of raw data. The next step is really about uh, actually projecting. This is really the uh, kind of crux that the projections uh, result from. So we need to identify some volume of sales. This is your first kind of scenario analysis, right? If we sell some number of units, what's the business going to look like? So if you already have operations, you can just say, well, last December, uh, we sold 100 units, so I'm going to put in 100 units for next December. Every, maybe you say every year in the past, we've grown 10% of sales year over year. So I'm going to add an additional 10% of sales for my next year of projections. Right? Those are good, uh, hard, evidenced reasons to use those numbers. But not everyone's going to have that data. So the question just becomes, what do different volumes look like? And we're ultimately going to get to that question of, is this breaking even? If not, I need to change maybe the volume of sales, maybe I need to change the prices, the cost, and so on. Uh, you're always going to revise this stuff. So if you're just starting off, just pick some numbers. Here, I just picked 100 units. Um, so this is just one row of units. So it's just adding up the same. It's not necessarily duplicated. It's just not adding anything else. Um, so each month, I say, what would it look like if I sold 100? and then 150, and then 200, 250, and then 300 for the rest of the year, each month. Uh, this totals up into just a volume of units sold. Right now, we don't know what the dollar amount is based on these volumes or anything else. 
So once you have this uh, entered somewhere, this is where you're gonna to start to do math. And there are plenty of templates. You can find Excel spreadsheets to, uh, um, to do this yourself. It'll have the math in it, but it's really straightforward math once you get these numbers uh, down somewhere. It's just gonna be a question of putting them all together. All right, so putting them all together, try not to get overwhelmed by what this slide looks like. Again, it's fairly straightforward um, uh, work that we're doing. The next step is to multiply the price per unit by the number of units sold, right? So in that September month, uh, I said 100 units and we've got a $2.50 price. So the revenue equals $250 in that month. The variable costs, uh, it's gonna be the cost of goods per unit times the number of units. So again, still 100 units in that month of September, but now we're multiplying that 97 cents which is the cost per unit, and we get $97. Then the next thing that we get with these two numbers, 250 uh, of revenue, 97 of uh, cost of goods, when we subtract the uh, variable cost or your cost of goods from revenue, that's when you get that gross profit figure. So this is telling you when you sell 100 cookies, uh, what's left for you to spend on the rest of the business. The rest of the business is what those fixed costs are, right? So we've got the 153 of gross profit. When we subtract the fixed cost or operating expenses from that, then we're left with a net income, or in this case, a net loss. So the parentheses here represent negative numbers. Um, so this would say, if you only sold 100 of these cookies, you're gonna lose $98. And then we move on. What does it look like to sell 150, 200, 250, 300? Only at that 300 uh, volume do we actually see a positive number in this net income. And, and uh, net income is your profit, right? So here there is positive profit, which means this January month is the break even number for profitability. You have broken even somewhere between this 250 and 300. So you might say, I need 300 sales in a month to be profitable. Right. That's the core of a basic set of projections that you need to do to be able to show a bank, a lender, a partner, investor, analysis, uh, analyst. Um, you want to be able to do this work and be able to talk about the volume of sales that you need or the total revenue that you need um, uh, uh, to be able to, to break even, cover all of businesses' costs. What we've done is create an income statement here. Uh, these sections, your revenue, cost of goods sold um, and your operating expenses, create the numbers like your gross profit or your uh, operating profit, also known as net income. Um, and that tells someone how the business is doing. The income statement, also known as your profit and loss statement, this is really your primary financial statement, talks about the performance of the business over a period of time. So typically you see this in an annual uh, representation, like what was the income statement for the year? Um, but you can do this monthly, you can even do it weekly, quarterly if you wanted, you can do it over a number uh, of years. Um, it's always going to have the sections of revenue and expenses and net income. And it's always gonna have them in this order. The top line is your sales. Uh, now you might have different types of sales. So there might be different categories within this revenue section, but the section's always gonna be the same. Right? It's the top line, it's the beginning of your story of your business. The next question then, once you say, well, my business sold $7,700 worth of cookies, how much did those sales cost? That's what the cost of goods sold is. So that comes right after. I really wanna think of this as like a vertical story that you're telling. And with $7,700 of cookies, well, it ended up costing me $3,000 uh, to make those sales. This means every time that I sell another $7,700 of cookies, I'm gonna have to spend another $3,000 uh, on those direct costs. That's why gross profit is such an important number for projections. Because if you're saying my business is gonna grow, it's gonna grow along with your cost of goods sold. The sales are uh, proportional to your cost of goods sold. And this might change as business structure changes, but uh, that's really the idea we wanna get to. Where, uh, which of these are proportional 
in which other ones are just based on kind of stage of the business. Right? So that's where the operating expenses would now come in. You've got these other things that you're paying for. Maybe you're uh, only paying for storage space because you don't have your own uh, uh, brick and mortar storefront. Maybe in five years from now, you're gonna have a brick and mortar storefront. We'll no longer have storage, but you'll now have rent. Right? So I often think about operating spaces as indicating kind of a, what stage the business is at. But we still need to know, what does a business need to pay for? And in this case, uh, the business needed to pay for $4,500 of additional uh, uh, cost that didn't come in from the cost of goods sold. So when that cost of goods sold left us with 4,700 of gross profit, and then we subtract 45 of operating expenses, um, we're left with only $230 of net income or profit. So the business has broken even, but it's pretty tight, right? If you just looked the cost at the gross profit, you'd say, oh, the business is doing well. But if you don't consider these other operating expenses, you're gonna realize that you're barely making profit. All right. So the, that might not cover everything. Sorry, before I uh, hop into this, again, we've got this vertical uh, depiction of how the business is doing in this year, but $230 might mean someone needs to close up shop. For someone else, it might mean, great, we've broken even, now I can invest more money. This only tells a part of the story. It's the core of the business. It's really just looking at the business, but it doesn't look at the context of ownership, capital. There's a bunch of other stuff that comes in in a cash flow statement. So what I want you to see here in this visual uh, vertical is that the bottom line, uh, which is what people refer to when they talk about a bottom line, is your net income, your profit. In this case, it's $230 for the year. Now, the cash flow statement is going to happen after that. So you'll see in an annual total of this cash flow statement that the bottom line of the profit and loss is the top line of the cash flow statement. Right? We start off where we left off. Um, so the cash flow statement would then say, what else did you pay for? Um, or where else did cash come from after you made this, uh, after the consideration of you making $230 in profit? So you might have had some money that you started the year off with, you might have had some changes in, in money afterwards, and then you would ultimately get a, a full picture of this cash flow statement. So I'm going to break this down in more detail. A uh, cash flow statement, similar to the profit and loss, has always has uh, some core sections. So uh, any business would have cash from operations, cash from investing, and cash from financing in their cash flow statement. And they might have a number of different um, categories within here that are different from business to business. But the general idea is once you figure out what that net income is, where else did money flow out of or flow into? Now, for example, inventory, if I paid for a bunch of materials, I didn't actually need to pay for them if I still have those, uh, that inventory. So it's called accrual accounting, essentially, right? In uh, terms of the materials that I expensed, uh, I only needed to pay for $1,600 of them to make the $7,700. If I added another $400 in, which is what I was left with in inventory at the end of the year, then I wouldn't have looked profitable at all, right? So this gives you some flexibility to structure. Yes, I did pay for an extra $400 of ingredients, but I didn't need them to make the $7,700. I still have that $400 worth of inventory. So that's why you want to distinguish it as, uh, or potentially why you want to distinguish it as not an expense, but an, uh, uh, an inventory adjustment that just shows up in your cash flow statement. Now, in this case, again, the uh, loss of that $400 that you had to spend starts making it look like the business didn't actually make any money. You've now got negative $170 in operations. There might be, uh, for some businesses, maybe you purchase an oven or some other equipment. You might not want to consider that part of your core business operations that show up on the profit and loss. So this is where they would go. Um, and then there's a question of what did the owners or the other sources of capital either contribute or take from the business. So if you start off your business with $1,000, those aren't sales. We don't want to see that in a profit and loss and think the business is doing well. And you certainly don't want to report it to the IRS if you've already paid income tax on it. So it comes in here and shows there's $1,000 the business started off with. So that $170 loss from operations, when that comes out of the 1000 we've still got 
positive cash. I've got $830 uh, of cash to use starting off this next year. And I've got $400 of inventory that's not yet gotten uh, used, all right? So I'm gonna put those two things together. Uh, this is called the Sankey chart. Uh, to me, it's a helpful visualization. The idea of on the left, what came into the business, like I said, the owner just deposited, invested their own thousand dollars. Then you made seventy seven hundred of sales. Where did those? Uh, where did that money go? Thirty four hundred went to cost of goods in these two uh, categories. Uh, then the gross profit that was left after the cost of goods in this forty seven hundred, forty five of it went to operating expenses in these uh, categories. What we end the year with, as mentioned. Uh, 230 of net income plus the remaining 600 of cash. And uh, that's that 830 of actual cash. And then there's this uh, actual product or material inventory of $400 that we use, right? So business has got a value of $1,230 that it can then use to make more sales, right? That's really, that's all gonna be really helpful to identify kind of what uh, changes, decisions you need to make or if you're ready to take on uh, capital. Um, so before I jump into the uh, 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 kind of last considerations, um, Ed, did, did you want to uh, contribute anything here? Uh, no, not really. I think you covered it pretty well, but again, you know, like I said, I just think it's important uh, to reiterate to the folks that are listening in that, you know, us understanding your cash flow when you're trying to access that capital is gonna be key. And, you know, putting together financials that make sense, that are clear, uh, that we can understand are going to be, you know, really important. And just, you know, I don't know, the other thing that I'll kind of add to that is just, you know, really being able to walk your lender um, through your numbers such that we can understand, you know, what you're basing, uh, you, you know, your numbers on. So there may be something that we see there that doesn't make sense to us. But, you know, you may know that there is a reason why you had a one time expense that was, you know, really high that, that you know, kind of ate into your profit margin a little bit. But, you know, just again, being able to walk us through those things are going to be, uh, you know, extremely important when, you know, when we're trying to make a decision as to whether or not we can get comfortable with, uh, with uh, uh, lending money. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I do, I, I want to uh, make sure there's time for questions, but uh, some of the, the kind of last things I want to leave you with, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but these are things that you can use exactly as Ed was uh, saying to help tell your story, right? So uh, first identifying what your actual break even is. And if it sounds like a reasonable thing, if you can convince someone you'll get to this point, that will help you be able to access capital or uh, whatever it is you need to do. Um, if someone asks you what your profit margins are, you want to know the difference between your gross margins and your operating margins, right? After those operating expenses come in. Um, there are other uh, decisions, especially when it comes to getting a loan, where if you're already operating, um, you, as I said, you need to be able to explain these cash flows. So some uh, cases, if you have a lot of existing debt already, um, there might be a question from that uh, lender if this business fails, are we going to get paid back? If you already owe a bunch of other people, first question, their first answer might be, we wouldn't get paid back if this business failed. So that would require you to tell a more convincing story. Um, there are other things that might help you in uh, uh, making decisions around your business. Things like your days of sales outstanding. Right? If you get paid on an invoice, how long does it actually take you to get paid back? That's what this DSO is. If you uh, are purchasing a lot of inventory, you're unsure if you should be uh, purchasing less, you can calculate uh, what your inventory turnover uh, is. If maybe you'll find out, you know, 50% of my inventory is not getting sold at any point in time, so I can buy 50% less. And that can open up cash flow for you to use on maybe increasing sales, whatever else you need to do. Uh, then there are some uh, less financial uh, 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 consumer behavior analytics I'll mention just as examples um, for things that can help tell the story about your business. Uh, and there's, uh, well, the, this uh, um, lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. This is financial. Um, you're going to take actual dollar amounts, what a typical customer brings in for you 
over their lifetime? How many sales are you making to uh, an average customer? And how much did it cost you to actually get any customer, right? So when you pay for $1,000 of marketing, did that bring in 100 uh, new clients for you? Then you've got you know, $10 uh, for each customer acquisition. And then you can compare these two and try to figure out, uh, am I spending enough? Uh, is, it, what, is what I'm spending money on working, generating enough of uh, uh, value from my uh, clients? Or is it not worth it? Am I spending too much, not making enough money from each of those clients? And similar ideas there um, would be trying to identify really what's efficient operations for you. So a lot of folks can get excited that their followers on Instagram are increasing. It's kind of idea of social reach, but every time you make a post, no one clicks on it, no one likes it, no one comments. Uh, then there's a question of, can I increase this engagement? Because ultimately we got to get these uh, uh, folks interacting with our business, with our website, with our social media pages, with our emails. We've got to get them buying what we're selling. Otherwise, the business is not doing well. It might be making a positive impact in the community, and that's certainly valuable. It might be something you enjoy doing. That's great. Uh, but if you're trying to make a profitable business, be able to or be able to pay back a loan, you need to be able to uh, show that sales are occurring. And the uh, um, little pictures you see here, this is another piece of definition, but also for um, your own uh, uh, considerations. Growth, uh, just growing the business, making more sales is certainly good, but um, there's a question of how much are you actually benefiting from those increases in sales? And if your expenses are growing at the same rate, then there's really no profit that's occurring with those additional sales. It might just be additional work getting on your plate. What you ideally wanna see as a business owner or an investor in a business would be scale, that as you grow the business, you're able to get more and more profit, right? So you're able to, uh, by adding more work, you're getting more benefit, right? So uh, two different uh, definitions or, or considerations. Uh, you don't need to prove this at first. Um, ideally, start with growth, get to scale. Um, that can be uh, really helpful for you. Um, so I do, I, I, I know that uh, pricing was, I think, mentioned right at the beginning. So before even questions come in, I'll just do this slide. You can watch CNBC or talk to other folks, experts in uh, business, and they will tell you about uh, some ideal equation for pricing that one uh, business type needs. And they might be 100% right if you listen to them. I don't know. I'm not going to make that assumption. What I suggest every business uh, does is consider really your two options, increasing the prices or lowering the prices. And you need to run projections on these to see what it would look like. In terms of increasing prices, uh, might seem nice to be able to get more money with each new sale, but at some point, uh, your customers probably are not going to continue to buy if your prices increase. That's what's called price elasticity, uh, otherwise known as price sensitivity. Um, so the common example there is, uh, is that most businesses are not oil companies. Oil companies selling gasoline when they increase prices, people still buy it because they need gas to get to work, to pick up kids, whatever it is. Uh, but for most of us, the businesses, uh, the services and products that we sell, if we keep increasing the prices, people are going to stop buying. So uh, ideally, you just test this out. You really say, I, for one week, I'm going to try this price. For another week, I'm going to try this price. Let's see what happens. Did people stop buying? In some cases, increasing the pricing has an effect on consumer psychology and they think your product is now more valuable because it has a certain price. I, I can't speculate on what that is, um, but it's ideally something you test out. The more traditional uh, consideration for growing the business um, is lowering prices, right? Because if folks don't have to spend as much to purchase your product, they'll probably purchase more of it. Um, this uh, can be helpful in trying to gain market share, uh, uh, take some of the money that's coming to your competitors and have it funnel through you instead. Um, uh, you can increase your revenue even though you're decreasing your profit per sale. If you're just trying to break into a market um, or break into an industry, you might want to have kind of sticker shock prices where people will buy just because it's such a low price. Some really important considerations here though, is that if you're in a really competitive industry um, and someone, a huge uh, business is your competitor, 
they probably own a good bit of their supply chain. And that means they can probably go really low on pricing without uh, losing profitability. So if you get into a race to the bottom of pricing with a huge competitor, uh, you might find yourself getting taken further than you wanted to. Uh, and the other thing is that being able to uh, discount your products or services at times when sales are slow, the market's tight, uh, is a really helpful thing to be able to, to keep cash flow coming in. So having some room to lower prices when you need to uh, in those discounts can be really helpful. All right, so uh, I will uh, uh, pass it over. Meredith, uh, it's a good time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ian, for walking us through all of this. It's so important to break down these pieces into sort of understandable steps. Um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to go through all of this with us. Um, and now I think um, it'll be a great time to spend a few minutes on questions. So we've had some questions come into the chat. Thank you, everybody who has done um, that for us with that engagement. I'm also gonna just remind everybody that you'll be able to see this recording and the slides. Um, so I popped that information in the chat for you as well. Um, so to get us started, you all feel free to continue to type questions into the chat, but to get us started, Ed, I'd love to bring you in um, to help us understand a little bit more about how projections kind of work in real life a bit. Um, so as a banker, I know that you've seen so many different customers who have businesses at different stages. And I'm wondering if you have a perspective on when a small business owner should really start focusing on these topics that Ian has shared on these more advanced projections, what business stage makes sense? Well, honestly, Meredith, I think this is uh, one of those topics that you should start uh, thinking about this stuff even before you go into business, because you need to understand, uh, you know, first of all, why are you going into business, right? And then you need to understand, again, what's realistic for the particular industry that you're in. And so when I say that, what I mean is sometimes you'll have someone that says, oh, I'm going to open up my own business and I want to be rich and I want to be this, this, and this. And, you know, they may go into an industry where, you know, this isn't an industry that you're probably going to get rich in, um, you know, not unless you franchise it and, you know, do some of the other things that, you know, we see some of these larger companies do. So I, I would say it starts at the very beginning. Um, and then, you know, it also helps you in the beginning with, you know, setting your pricing so that you know, you know, am I overcharging? Am I undercharging? Because there is a fine line that you have to walk there. And one of the things that I always say to small businesses is that, you know, you can't be afraid to charge for your services, especially if you're offering a quality or a premier service, but you have to be able to market that and get people to understand and get those clients through the door. Um, and, you know, related to that, for those businesses that are already in business, you know, doing these types of activities really should be a, a living, breathing thing that you're doing with your numbers um, so that you can see, you know, different trends that are going on uh, in your business and in your business's uh, particular industry. And so, you know, I don't think it's just a, a one-time thing that you do at the beginning or in the middle or towards the end. It's something that should be ongoing and you should, you know, consistently be concerned with pricing and making sure that you are, you know, again, uh, that your business is functioning properly. And, you know, again, that there are no pitfalls waiting for you down the road. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, Meredith. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed. I think that makes a ton of sense. It's kind of never too early to at least start thinking about a lot of these things. And then I, I love what you said about consistently coming back to this. And I think, Ian, that's something that you touched on as well. You got to have a good, consistent relationship with your numbers. Um, Ian, anything to add on that point about when to get started? Yeah, I think uh, you, you want to do one as soon as you come up with an idea, make sure it's feasible. And uh, and we I don't want to pitch too much for what our services are, but um, there's a slide at the end that has a, a link to a survey. So if anyone does want to do this basic idea, do I know my, what my numbers are? Is it feasible? Um, you, can, uh, uh, you can do a quick survey. And uh, if there seems to be a really urgent concern, um, we can try to arrange direct service delivery even before you become a, a client too. Um, so I, I say get started as soon as you come up with an idea. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I'm going to take one more question because um, we had a lot of great ones come into the chat. Um, but this is a question we received that I think is really 
kind of emblematic of what we see with a lot of clients. Um, so Annalie is saying that she's only been in business for a year, but she has investors who want to see two years of projections and wondering if it's acceptable for her to forecast based on comparable businesses or maybe on competitors. Ian, what's your perspective? Do you think that if a business owner doesn't have enough of their own data? Is it ever acceptable to kind of bring in other comparable data or other sources on that? Yeah, I, I mean, this is unfortunately a, a common challenge, especially mm -hmm. for early stage businesses. Um, and uh, this really gets to a larger idea that when you're working with investors, lenders, um, or even contractors, clients, you're, you're doing negotiations to a degree. And you need to convince the person on the other side of it that what you're offering is worth uh, what they're going to have to pay. Um, so absolutely, you want to pull in that data. Uh, and Ed was talking before about you know ideas of uh, specific, uh, I'm, I'm on this street, it's a low volume, this industry. All those things can be incredibly helpful in convincing someone that your numbers are right. And kind of more, uh, more simply convincing you that they're believable, that this is going to work in this way. So absolutely, there's a num one thing I would say here, if you're not working directly with a bank or a partner or something, you can go to your library and talk to them about researching industries. Librarians are literally our research experts. Um, so they can help you work through kind of business resources, publications, try to find uh, uh, things that are helpful, either directly with your competitors or uh, kind of industry averages as well. A great idea. Thanks, Ian. All right. So I think that's all the time we're going to have for today. I want to make sure to point everybody to additional resources because we had a lot of questions in the chat about working one on one or learning more about these things, kind of getting educated on pricing. So um, Ian works for a fantastic organization called Start Small, Think Big. So I will put the link to their website in the chat now. And then also, of course, Fifth Third Bank and Axiom Opportunity Fund also have resources available. So you can check out all of those websites to kind of learn more about these different things um, and keep the conversation going about your financial projections. Um, I want to thank Fifth Third Bank and Start Small Think Big for being such great partners on this event for us. Thank you, Ian and Ed, for your time. Really appreciate you all joining us and sharing your insights today. Um, and we will see you at the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.